All right, Joshua chapter 3 is where we're going to be. We are going to get ready to cross the Jordan River. It happens in chapter 3 and chapter 4. I split it up because chapter 4 we get to play with the 12 stones. And I like talking about the stones and what they symbolize and how we have stones in our life. And so I decided to split chapter 3 and chapter 4 and what we're working with. Chapter 3 is a lot of fun. Uh, two phrases we're going to see that we're going to bring out of the text, and I don't think we are taking them out of context, but I like them as far as if you're ever coming up with a devotional thought, or if there's something you want to think about for a while. The first one is in verse 4-ish. I don't remember exactly where we'll come across it. God says, I want you to sanctify yourself. I want you to follow closely because where you're going, you have never gone before. Follow Joshua because where you're going, you've never gone before. And that's a fun lesson. It's good for like when you have graduates or when you're talking about a, opening up a new building or opening up something that's new, starting a new program or whatever else it is. And the other one is a type, any type, uh, one of those old things that preachers used to do where you go back and forth where the Jordan River is rolled back. And we usually focus on that rolling back, but what's interesting about the rolling back is the waters are rolled all the way back to the city of Adam. All right? Now, do you think that water rolling back all the way to Adam has any implications? I think so, because as we're talking about the significance of the Jordan River entering into the promised land and things such as that, I think you have some stuff there that uh, works pretty well for what we're covering. All right, so let's start here in verse 3, or verse 1 of chapter 3. This is New King James I'm reading from. And Joshua rose early in the morning. They set out from the Achaia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and they lodged there before they crossed over. Now God makes sure they don't go immediately. Look there in verse 2. So it was that after three days, the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests and Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, so that you may know the way by which you must go. Here it is. For you have not passed this way before. All right, God leads Israel. They've just seen Jericho. They're ready to cross into the land. They're ready to fight. God leads them to the Jordan River, and he leaves them. Three days. No communication. No, hey, let's build a pontoon bridge. Let's find some swimmers. Let's build a boat. Nothing. Why? Why would God take them there and have them sit for three days? Okay, while you're thinking that over, <laughs> let's look at the second paragraph here. The Jordan River, typically during flood stage, well, it's usually about 100 feet across. Not a huge river, 12 feet deep, but during flooding season, it'll grow up to 200 feet deep and become much quicker. The river connects the Sea of Galilee all the way down to the Dead Sea, meandering path about 200 miles. Swift and dangerous because its bed will drop an average of 9 feet per mile over its course. An example of how difficult it was, uh, found over in 1 Chronicles 12, 15, when many people drowned in a river. Okay, in this passage, the Gadites are considered to be heroes because they're able to swim across the Jordan River during the flood stage. If these strong men who are renowned as heroes for accomplishing this, imagine what it would be like when your whole nation, the older folks, the, the younger folks, the ladies, all the possessions, imagine how difficult it would be to cross. God brings them to this river, and they wait three days. Does God always work in our time? Absolutely not. He doesn't. And are there some times where we go through life, and we get to a point, and we know where we want to be, which is on the other side of the Jordan River, but we can't figure out how to get there, and God makes us wait. 
Why does he make us wait? Why did God use a little boy named David to kill big old king or kill big old giant Goliath? Why did God pick little old Gideon? What you got, Brad? Oh, sure, yeah. They're not going to be able to figure this out. And there's a lot of times in my life and your life, we're going to get to a point where this is a dead end. I, I can't figure out how to get across this. I can't figure out how to do this. God, you've led me somewhere. You've brought me somewhere. And there is, there is not a solution. There is not a way that we can get over that river and get where we want to be. Yes, ma'am. Right, right. She says a lot of this is the fact that we have to give glory to God. Our culture, even our religious culture, says, man, you know, I'm able to accomplish this. I'm able to do this. I'm able to do that. I'm able to fix this problem, that problem, whatever else it may be. What did God tell Paul? 2 Corinthians 12. My strength is shown through your what? Through your weakness. Okay. My strength is shown through your weakness. So there are times where God's going to take you to a point, and you're not going to see how you're going to survive this. You're not going to see how you're going to get past it. Now, God will get you past it. But sometimes he leaves you there for a second just so you realize this is not something I can do. And you'll notice here in about three weeks when we finally get to Jericho that God does not use the amazing fighting power of the Israelites to wipe out the city. God constantly, at least at this beginning, and actually through the entire book, is showing the children of Israel, you succeed by the faith that you have in God. And that lesson applies to us today even as much, even as well. So notice that verse 4, the very end of it, you have not passed this way before. Nobody has experience in this. And the only way you're going to make it in this new life, the only way that you're going to make it and be successful and grab the land which God has given you is by following after him. All right, so now verse 5. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spoke to the free, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. And so they took up the Ark of the Covenant and they went before the people. All right. Sanctify yourself. What's the word sanctify mean? The Greek word is hagios. It's translated in the Bible. The verb is sanctify. The noun is holy. Both of them mean the same thing. Make yourself holy and then God's going to work things through you. Once again, showing us we don't do these things by our own power, by our own might, by our own strength. You have to be holy before God for God to see you through the situation, for God to be able to see you through these things. And so the symbolism here of following the ark is the same symbolism of following God. We see that over in Numbers chapter 10. Now, how is the ark carried? All right, you had the pole system, right? You'd have the Levites and you'd have the Achaia poles pushed through and then they would carry it everywhere. Now we'll see in several generations from now, King David, before he's king. Well, yeah, well, let's see. Let's not do David. I guess it's Eli, I guess it is, Judge Eli. Uh, that's a few generations from this point. They get caught up in the ways of the world, right? The Philistines, who they're dealing with and many other people, the way that they would show great honor to their gods is by creating a cart and putting their idol on the cart and parading it in front of everybody because, you know, that's the expensive vehicle of that day. Uh, used to, we'd say the expensive vehicle was the Cadillac or the Lexus. I think nowadays it's a pickup truck. Those seem to be the most expensive cars out there, I think, sometimes. Oh, my goodness. All right. 
that was the expensive way of doing it. So remember when Eli's sons lost the Ark of the Covenant and the Ark of the Covenant went to the temple of Gedagon and the Philistines found out pretty quick, hey, we don't mind killing the Israelites, but we don't want to mess with this God. And they said, hey, we're going to give you your God back. And so they sent the Ark back on a cart with golden rats and golden boils or warts, whatever a golden wart would look like. Uh, kind of a weird thought process there. Glad I'm not Philistine. But they sent it back. That was how you showed great honor. Well, David listened to the nations, and it was time for them to become just as modern as everybody else. And so when they're bringing the ark from Shiloh to Jerusalem, how does he decide to bring it? Puts it on a cart, right? Brand new cart, most expensive thing they had, and they go on the way, the oxen stumble, and Uzzah does what? He steadies it, and God strikes him dead. Because God, even if it seems old-fashioned, we show honor to God by following exactly according to his word. And so you have the uh, ark, which is carried by the Levites. Levi had five sons. Remember, Nadab and Abihu died. And the three remaining sons each had a job, and the Kohathites, their job was to carry the ark. All right, so the four times, according to Adam Clark's commentary, four times the Levites carried the ark. When Jericho was surrounded, when David finally realized his job to take it back to Jerusalem, during the war against the Philistines, and when it's moved from the tabernacle to the temple. That's the four times we have a record of it being carried that way. Of course, it was carried that way that 40 years through the wilderness as well. All right, and so they're sanctified, and they get these things all straight in their life. They are to ceremonially wash themselves, wash all their possessions. They are to make sure that they are absolutely without sin, and they're supposed to be ready in God before they pass through this river. Why? Three reasons. First, shows the authority of God as they follow Joshua. Secondly, strengthen the children of Israel. And a time had come for the sinful inhabitants to be destroyed, <coughs> which is going to come. All right, so let's keep reading here. The Lord, verse 7, said to Joshua, This day I will exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was Moses, so I am with you. See, that's, that's number one. You shall command a priest who bear the ark, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water, you shall stand in the Jordan. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord. By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive you out, drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gagashabites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and read verse 12 or 11. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. All right, we'll stop right there. Now, they come across, that ark symbolizes the power of God. When we're thinking about this idea of the um, river, think of, if you will, something close to the width of the Ohio River. Now, the Ohio River is a whole lot deeper than what we're talking about when we're talking about this, this, uh, this river, which is here. But you can imagine how confident you would be if someone told you to walk out into that river, knee-deep, waist-deep, or so far. That would make you pretty nervous, right? It's a pretty good current which is going on there. And, you know, a lot of times people, even when they cross just a small spance of water with their car, they can get swept off the road. Water has a great amount of power. So you can imagine how stressful that would be. Now put along with that, carrying this heavy ark, and imagine having something this holy and this precious, and you step out into the river, how much faith that takes. God is calling them to step out in faith, put themselves in an uncomfortable situation, and at that point, he is going to accomplish something that is absolutely great. So they come out, and as they go through, as soon as the soles of their feet, verse 13, as soon as the soles shall rest in the water, 
The waters of Jordan are cut off and come down from upstream, and they shall stand up as a heap. And so as they come across, you'll see there in verse 14 and 15, the, the feet of the priests who bore the ark dipped in the edge of the water. Jordan overflows during this time. And the waters came down from upstream, stood still, and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zeraton. By the way, we have no idea where those two cities are today. The Salt Sea failed and were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Now imagine how high this heap would be. If you've got a fast-flowing river and it stops, it's going to start filling up, right? And so it just builds upon itself and builds upon itself and builds upon itself. It becomes a pretty scary-looking situation as it goes on. Now I want to take a second, and as we think about this, first of all, let's talk about it as far as a miracle. This is a miracle. How did God do it? Uh, you'll run across a lot, a lot of commentaries. I'll tell you a lot of history and such. Uh, in the year 1266, the Jordan River went dry for 10 hours because of a mudslide. Mudslide upstream, it caused it to stand still for 10 hours. 1927, uh, for 21 hours, another mudslide came, and coincidentally, it was near the same place, around the city of Adam, and that mudslide caused it to stop as well. And so if a mudslide could do this in 1266 and also this other year, 1921, maybe it was a mudslide that God used the second that the priest stepped into the water. Now, does that mean that this is not a miracle? What makes it a miracle? It's the timing. Those feet hit the water, and that far up there, suddenly there's a mudslide or whatever, and the water's just... They saw the water go up. That's right. Yeah. And so they were able to see the water heap up on itself. All right. So you see something interesting here as God's doing this. Now, another quick aside I want us to do very quickly... All right, we're doing good on time. Look at us. All right, another aside we're looking at. Compare crossing the Jordan to crossing the Red Sea. Remember, if you go back with me to the book of Exodus, crossing the Red Sea, Israel is now free from Egypt. Woohoo! We have got all their earrings and nose rings. Life is good. And so here we go. We're just out here in the wilderness. Life is good. We're free. We're happy. And we're headed over to the promised land, the land which is promised to us from Abraham. And suddenly there is the dust on the horizon, and they realize the Egyptians have changed their minds, and here they come to beat them and to take them back into slavery. They know they're in trouble. There's no way they can fight off this Egyptian army. And so they begin to run, and as they run, they run right into the Red Sea. There's no way they can cross it. So God develops a cloud and a wall of fire between them and the Egyptian army. And then he says, I'm about to do a great thing before you. And then he tells Moses to look over the Red Sea and to do what? Hold the staff up. And at that point, the Red Sea parts, and they're able to cross. And then Moses brings the Red Sea back together. And the Charlton Heston version of the Bible, all those Egyptians just are drowned and they float away. And Charlton Heston list looks really, really cool. You remember Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments? Great movie right there, right? Okay, I'm not sure it's inspired, but, the, I, you know, that's what I think of Moses when I'm thinking of him. All right. So anyway, when it happens... The Israelites are panicked. Is there a lot of faith that takes them across the Red Sea? Well, there's some faith because, you know, that's a scary place to go. But they are running away from a fight that they know they can't win. They are running away from a fight. God provides a way of escape, and so therefore they go. Now, here we are 40 years later, and they're not scared. Instead of running from a fight, now they're marching to a fight. Now, instead of having a prophet raise his staff, we make the point that even though it was God working through Moses, it's a little bit more clearly God working now because when the ark hits that water, when the feet of the priest carrying the ark hits that water, it parts, 
and then they're able to travel through. And so there's a difference between the Canaan and between the Jordan, or between the Red Sea and between the Jordan, and going in that way. Now, if you want to spend some more time on that, you can make a lot more differences as well. Now, if you play with our songs, our church songs, if you turn through these hymnals, or if you think through a lot of the songs which we sing, this is an example of life, right? What are some songs that talk about Canaan's land, about the Jordan River, or about the Red Sea? On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye, okay? To Canaan's happy, fair and happy land where my possessions lie, okay? All right, what's another one? Yeah. To Canaan's land I'm on my way where the soul of man never dies. All right, what's another one? I'm camping in Canaan's happy land, yes. One of the hardest pitched songs anywhere. Got to work hard on that one, I think. Okay, what's well, another one? Roll, Jordan, roll, but that's an old one. Okay. <laughs> I'm observing the Passover. He says in your Revelation class that you remembered that Moses did something, that you saw him yourself. Is that what you said? Oh, roll Jordan, roll. Okay. Won't have to cross Jordan alone. <laughs> he might get some help, huh? All right. <laughs> All right. So working through those songs, why do we like the Jordan so much? Why do we like Canaan so much? The typology is when we're in Egypt, we're in sin. We're following pagan gods, following ourselves. all these things. God takes us. And as we are baptized through the Red Sea, if you're remembering 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where a lot of this comes from, and chapter 9, we are now added to the Lord's church. We are now God's special holy people. Now we are wandering through the world, struggling with our faith, growing in our faith, and we, when we reach our journey, we reach the promised land, and we cross that Jordan River, which to many people symbolizes death, our physical death, we enter into the promise of God, which is in heaven. Now, is all that right, Lonnie? All right, I think Lonnie wrote that book. Yeah. And so there's a type and typology, type and any type, which is going on back and forth with all of that. That's the reason our songs go there, and that's what we're seeing. Now, if you're wanting to know where these songwriters get it, mainly 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 10 is what we're working with quite a bit there. All right, so the river is pushed back, and as the river is pushed back all the way back to Adam, the people are able to cross over. And so as they go, let's see where I'm thinking, pass back to Adam, see that in verse 16, goes all the way back to the Sea of Erebus, the salt sea, the dead sea as weeds call it, uh, fails because there's no water going into it. And the priests who bore the ark stand firm on the dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all of Israel crosses over in dry ground until the people had completely crossed over it. And we'll see in chapter 4 that once everybody comes across, once we get our stones, then at that point the priest will come back up and the water will return once again. All right, so let's go through some of the, these applications here. God brought the Israelites to the river. God parted the water, but what did the people have to do? They had to walk across it. Now, was that hard work? It, that water piling and stacking and stacking and stacking, it's stressful. It's stressful. Now, since Martin Luther, oh, since Augustine and before Augustine, people have argued about soteriology. As Latin for salvation. In religious things, people always want to put Latin there to make themselves look smart. But argued about salvation. Does God save you or does man save you? Obviously, God saves us. God paid for us by the blood of his son. God created the church. God has created opportunity, time, this world, everything in order for us to be faithful. 
So when we say that God saves you, does that mean that man does not play a role? Of course man plays a role. Now, it's insignificant compared to what God did, but God always expects us to be faithful. God always expects us to act. You run through Hebrews 11, you see all these different ways in which God worked. By faith, Abraham left. By faith, Noah built. By faith, Enoch walked. You'll notice each one of those, by faith, the person did something. And so we have a role to play in our salvation, okay? Application number two, Jordan is a symbol of death. God rolls it all the way back to Adam and makes a way to cross over to the promised land. There you are working with that name. What is that reminding us of? When Jesus died, it brought salvation to everybody living at that day all the way until the present time, right? But what about the people in the Old Testament? Were they saved before Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected? Their sins were, as we say colloquially, rolled back. All the way back to Adam, God created a way of salvation for us to pass through. Closely to that, here we see the ark standing in the river. We see next chapter the stones standing in the river. And 1 Corinthians 10 really hammers those stones. That stone is Christ, right? And so you and I have to pass through God, through Christ for salvation. All the way back to Adam and all the way over to the Dead Sea, all that area passes through Christ in order to get where we need to go. All right, you see the typology there? The lesson which is being taught as we go back and look at these names and look at these things. All right, so how do you and I today pass through Christ, especially through the river of Christ? Baptism. Think Romans 6, right? Romans 6, 3 and 4. Therefore, you and I, we are baptized into Christ. That just as he died to sin, was buried and was raised, so also we die, we're buried and we're raised to walk in newness of life. You've got to pass through Christ in order to get to that other side. Abraham was saved through Christ. You and I today, on the other end of the spectrum, are saved through Christ. And all the apostles, everybody comes through that place, that spot. That is the place where it should be, okay? Some of God's blessings come to all all people, but only God's children receive special blessings. He makes it to rain on the just and the unjust, right? Every person living today got to wake up and got to feel that nice, cool air got to see what little sunshine there was, got to live a day of life. And for some, that includes food, that includes water, that includes all the blessings which God has given us. But there are some spiritual blessings reserved only for Christians, right? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, every spiritual blessing is found in the heavenly places, is found in Christ. Okay, here's the questions. These are answered in the writing here. Three reasons why God parted the Jordan River. Now, they could have built boats. They could have built a pontoon bridge. It had been done before. What were some of these reasons? Okay, they had to learn to follow Joshua. Okay, Moses is gone. Joshua is the leader. He's the one who's going to be telling you what to do. You're not getting across this river unless you understand you're following Joshua. Excellent. Okay, what's the next one? You can't reach salvation without faith in God. Absolutely. Encourage and strengthen the children of Israel. And the time for judgment had come. If you go back to Genesis, and we'll do this about lesson 10, lesson 9, when we talk about the moral difficulty of why God would kill all the Canaanites, the children, the women, even the animals. If you'll, We'll go back to Genesis and see three times 
God told all these people of Canaan to repent and to make things right, otherwise they would be destroyed. He told them to repent. At that time, they actually were faithful. You had Melchizedek, king of Salem. You had a lot of priests, a lot of prophets who were teaching God's word. And these 400 years, all that had gone away, and they had given up on God completely. And so that's the reason this judgment is coming. And so coming out of the water is coming the judgment of God, which will be here soon. Okay. The Israelites in the Red Sea, Israelites in the Jordan. One's running from a fight. One is running to a fight. One is done without faith. They hadn't grown to have faith yet. One has grown because that faith has come. The next generation has come, and these people trust God. One comes through Moses. The other one comes through God. Okay. All right. And when did the Jordan River part? When the priests did what? Stepped into the water. Okay. God made Israel wait three days before they could cross the Jordan River. What some things that you and I as Christians wait for today? Second coming. Right. Okay. We're waiting. Now, sometimes we got that a little bit messed up. I, I know I spent a lot of my life saying, Lord, I want you to come, but I prefer you wait a little while. You know, want to get married, want to have all these kids, uh, want to have these kids move out. You know, I, I got this I want to accomplish, got that I want to accomplish, whatever else it may be. Okay. Why should Christians long for the coming of the Lord? I, I had trouble understanding when you're finishing Revelation where John is saying, Come, Lord Jesus. Even so, Lord, I'm ready for you to come. Why is it sometimes we're not ready to see Jesus? We're saved. It's what? Okay, we like the world. Okay. Uh, we don't realize just how awesome heaven's going to be. You don't realize how absolutely great heaven will be when we get there. Okay? Oh, you're thinking of other people, too. That you want them to be saved. You want them to have an opportunity to come to Jesus. Is that what you mean, Don? Yeah, and your children. Yeah, absolutely. If you knew what was waiting for you, you'd be ready to go. This, this example does not compare at all. It's much smaller than what we really have. Every year, our kids who are at South and North Middle School, it's time to go to the high school, and they are scared to death. You talk to them in July, and they're just like, oh, man, you know, I'm going to go walk through the school, find where my locker is and all this stuff. Just about every time, I know it doesn't happen every time, but just about every time, you talk to those kids about November, and they will tell you high school is so much better than middle school. They love it so much more. Now, like I said, that may not be true for everybody. But a lot of times when we haven't experienced something, we don't realize just how good it's going to be and just how wonderful it's going to be. All right. God tells Israel to sanctify itself for the crossing of the sea. What are some ways in which we sanctify ourselves today? Make ourselves holy. Worship. Worship. Study. Study the Word of God, prayer, fellowship. Putting good things in our mind rather than negative things in our mind. Okay. What you put in there is who you become. 